and it will be distributed along with all of the slides that you see and any documents that we refer to. Uh, we are going to ask, since this is a meeting format, uh, to keep yourself muted unless you are speaking. And if you have a question, um, as we are talking, you can put it in the chat. And then after we are done, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. So we are going to ask you to use the raise hand function. Um, we will talk about that when we get there, if you uh, ha have uh, some trouble locating it. So this, like I said, is for advanced ECs. So this will not be covering fundamentals. If you wanna learn more about fundamentals uh, for environmental commissioners, check out ANJAC's YouTube page. We have recordings from, gosh, we have done now three virtual uh, fundamentals for environment, effective environmental commissioners courses. And all of those recordings are available on our YouTube page. And like I said, we are going to open it up for discussion after our panelists talk and I will get to who those are in just a second. Here is our agenda for tonight. So first, um, I will be talking. Um, I am Alex Ambrose. I am the policy associate at ANJAC and I'm also the chair of Clinton Township Environmental Commission in Hunterdon County. Then we will have a, my friend Janine from Manalapin. Uh, she's also a former ANJAC board member. Uh, then we'll have Vicki Benetti, uh, who is Washington Township in Gloucester County, um, the chair of the EC there. And then after that, we will have uh, time for discussion and Q&A. Our goal is to wrap up before 8.30 tonight. So this may look familiar to some of you. I use this slide in uh, a few of my presentations. I just want to hammer home, no two environmental commissions are alike. A lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today is ideas for you and inspiration for you. It is not meant to be strict rules that you follow. Every environmental commission is different because every town is different. So this is not meant to be a cookie cutter approach to environmental commissions. You do not need to do everything that we talk about today. So let me go into what my part of the uh, presentation tonight is going to go over. First, we're going to talk about goal setting. We're going to go over some administration, a little bit of the nitty gritty boring stuff like agenda, minutes, using technology. We're going to talk about communications, uh, both social media, outreach, recruiting people, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to talk about uh, collaboration and support, so how to get support for your ideas, such as working with elected officials and creating partnerships. And then we're going to talk about leadership. And before we get into all of that, I kind of just want to ground what we're going to be talking about today and talk a little bit about why. So um, Janine is smiling uh, because she is also uh, a former EPA employee. Um, I just want to read this quote from Lisa Jackson, who is a former EPA administrator for our region. All environmentalism begins locally somehow. Most people don't wake up in the morning and go, you know what, I think I really want to fight for clean air today. They do it because they've seen the impact of dirty air, or they've seen a favorite fishing hole or a favorite place that they love go become foul by pollution. So you have to respect that and recognize that. Environmental issues may have a common nexus, but they can be very, very localized. So I just want to say that environmental commissions, especially in the next few years, few decades, as we approach this climate change crisis, are going to be so important and key in the fight against climate change and in many other environmental priorities. So Keep in mind, what we do is so important, and that's why we at ANJAC want to make sure that you have all the tools uh, to be as effective as you can be. So this is one of the documents that we are going to distribute. This is an Environmental Commission self-assessment. This is something that you can do as an activity with your Environmental Commission to kind of uh, get, a, get an idea of where you are as an Environmental Commission. Ideally, you'd want all to be in the three column where it says superstar. However, that is incredibly hard and will take many, many years of work to get there. So I just wanna say, this is not a graded assignment. You should not feel, fill this out and then take it personally. What this is, is just meant to be an assessment to see what you want to work on, what opportunities you have as an environmental commission. Some of the um, categories here are membership, relationship with municipal officials, financial resources, and community outreach and visibility. So some of the things we're gonna talk about tonight. 
like I said, we're going to distribute this. This is a very good activity to do as an environmental commission. Everyone do it separately and then come together and discuss um, each of your assessments and why, where you think you are. All right, so let's talk about goal setting. So when you are setting a goal, you need to first start with your purpose or mission statement. If your environmental commission does not have a mission statement, like I said, feel free to go back and check out our fundamentals course where we talk about that. But that is where you wanna be pulling from when you're setting your goals. This should also help you define your vision. So where do you want your town to be? Where do you want your environmental resources to be in five, 10, 15 years? Your goals should be three things, realistic, measurable, and achievable. So realistic, meaning something you can actually do, measurable, meaning you can measure the results, and achievable, again, be able to actually be completed. And I wanna talk about results as well. So when you're setting these goals, you also wanna set uh, measurements and ways that you can make sure that you uh, achieve those goals. So is your goal, I'm gonna get $5,000 in funding for the town to do environmental work. You know you will achieve that when you hit that $5,000 mark. To set these goals, you should identify and meet with some key stakeholders and use your member skills. Here are some of the stakeholders that uh, ANJAC has identified. Again, not every environmental commission, not every town is gonna have all of these stakeholders, but this is kind of just so you can get inspiration and an idea of who those stakeholders are. Meeting with these stakeholders is gonna help you as an environmental commission be as effective as you can because you may be able to find common ground with some of these uh, places. So for example, uh, my EC in Clinton Township, we are working um, with the school because there are certain honor society students that need uh, community service hours. What a great goal for us to work together on. Then we, we can get volunteers to come out and help us with events and we can help them achieve their goals as well. Meeting with those stakeholders is really gonna help you identify a lot of those goals. And like I said, also using your members' skills. So knowing who is in your environmental commission and having relationships with everyone, knowing what their strengths are. If you have one person who's a civil engineer, amazing by the way, if you have that, you're very lucky. I hope you, I hope you realize that. Make sure that they are able to use those skills. You have one person who is a communications whiz. All of those will help you identify your goals. And just a little Steve Buscemi meme. Uh, this is how you can approach um, some of the students. Uh, just, you know, walk in, you know, just make sure that they know that you are there to help them achieve their goal uh, and then they can help you achieve your goal. All right, a little bit of the nitty gritty administration stuff. Um, the reason I brought this up is because the last time we had a webinar about this, some people had questions about it. So how to set an agenda. Um, I will talk about my best practice. This is a very boring looking slide, but it is an important one. What I do for my environmental commission is, my goal is the Monday before our environmental commission meeting, because we meet on Thursdays, I send out the agenda to the entire environmental commission. We keep ours very simple. As you can see here, we have the open public meeting acts announcement. We have our roll call. And then we have certain sections. So open to the public, if anyone from the public is there and wants to speak, we approve the minutes, any correspondence. So that's any letters that we've received. Then we have each of the reports from each of the various boards and councils. So we have the town council, the planning board, which everyone has a planning board liaison on their environmental commission. We have an open space uh, um, shared member as well the green team, uh, we are very excited for the first year we have a green team. And we also have a watershed ambassador. So we have each of those always give reports. Then we cover any old business. So for this, I literally copy and paste the new business and old business from my old agenda and put it here, just as a reminder to make sure that we go over anything that um, wasn't covered in the last meeting. And new business. So this is where I put anything new I wanna talk about. And then when I send it out, I send it as a shared Google doc so that anyone can go in and add things. You can see my vice chair Mario added Brown Valley Reservoir Tour. He wants to talk about that. I have no idea what it is, but the fact that he put it there reminds me that I need to call on him when we get there. Then if we have any site plan reviews, 
We did not get any this month, so we say none received. And then we motion to adjourn. So I just wanted to show you what our, our agendas look like. Um, we can certainly share other kinds of agendas. Many people have different ways of sending them out, but I just wanted to talk about what my best practices are for agendas. Minutes. I hate doing minutes, but they are legally necessary. Um, I'm fortunate that I have a great volunteer on my environmental commission that normally volunteers to do them. Um, at the beginning of every meeting, make sure you have someone taking minutes so you are not scrolling last minute uh, trying to remember what you talked about. Uh, we often use our agenda um, to take notes so that we can put together minutes afterwards. Um, and then minutes also have to go to the township administrator. Uh, we also try to post our minutes on our website as well as soon as they are approved. Finally, annual report. This is your time to brag. Your annual report is something that is required in the enabling legislation for environmental commissions. Your annual report is so, so important for environmental commissions because it is your time to talk about not only your accomplishments, but what you plan to do for next year. We have seen some environmental commissions come under threat. I'm gonna talk about those in a little bit and having those annual reports as comprehensive as possible bragging about everything you've done, every single thing you've done, no matter how small, is so essential to proving that the Environmental Commission is important. Um, I can't remember if I put it on this slide, but also you should um, uh, present your annual report. So talk to your town council and see if they can uh, set aside time during one of the meetings in January um, for you to come and present your annual report because it's important that not only your liaison, but the entire town council and the public know what the Environmental Commission is doing. Finally, technology. So technology, oh, that friend and enemy. Um, what we use technology for is I allow anyone to join via WebEx anytime that they want. So my town uses WebEx for um, Environmental Commission meetings. Um, I feel very strongly that it helps with accessibility, it helps with attendance, um, if folks have kids, you know, I'm, I'm very understanding of people joining virtually. If they can join in person, I know that they will, sometimes they can't always. It's also a great idea because you can allow the public to join that way also. Uh, just make sure that it is up on the website as part of the Open Public Meetings Act, whatever that link is. We also use Google Drive. Um, and we share that with uh, all of our members. So any documents we need to upload, all of our minutes are there, all of our annual reports, any goals that we set, we keep all of those documented in a Google Drive that everyone shares. And finally, a reminder about OPMA. So that's the Open Public Meetings Act. If you are sending things via email, every single time someone replies all, you are getting closer and closer to a violation of the Open Public Meetings Act. A good practice, is to either BCC everyone on the Environmental Commission when you're sending something out, have the township administrator send everything out, or just ask everyone not to reply all when you send out an email. There's been no um, challenge to email in OPMA, but I don't want any of you to be the uh, precedent for that, to be that, uh, that first challenge. So just try to keep best practices Try not to have group chats with just the um, Environmental Commission. Try not to have email threads with just the Environmental Commission. Um, you know, just try to try to set that uh, at good practice right at the start. All right, communications. Everyone should be on social media. It is 2022. Everyone should have at least a Facebook page. It's also important to know your audience. So for us. Um, in my town, a lot of residents are on Facebook. So we wanted to focus on having a Facebook page. If you encounter pushback from the town about having a social media page just for the Environmental Commission or Green Team, uh, please check out our social media training on YouTube. We actually had some uh, Environmental Commission chairs from uh, commissions that um, did have pushback. And what they did was they created a social media policy that they then presented to the town council and the town council let them have their Facebook uh, page because they had these guidelines set. Um, the Environmental Commission, I also view us as a liaison between the community and elected officials. So this is a good way to build trust both in your community and with elected officials. 
Um, if, I, if I see something on Facebook, if I hear something that my neighbors say that they're complaining about in the town, even if it's not environmentally related, I just let my elected officials know. You know, they know my name, they know who I am, and it kind of builds that trust of, I'm just letting you know, this is what my neighbor says, hopefully you can solve this problem. So that's kind of, I, I think that's a good way to build up that relationship. And if you, no matter what you try, can't get your own Facebook page, use existing communications in the municipality and beyond the municipality. So these are places where you can both brag about what the uh, Environmental Commission has done. These are places where you can advertise for events. You can advertise if you are recruiting members. Here, and here's some ideas. Almost every town has a newsletter that they either mail out or email out. Talk to whoever in your town is in charge of that. Most of the time it is the town administrator and you as an environmental commission should be best friends with your town administrator. They are the ones that, is behind, that are behind almost everything. They're the ones behind the budget. They're the ones behind the newsletter. They are the ones behind communications. Make sure you know your town administrator and maybe like buy them some coffee or a bottle of wine every now and then just to stay on their good side. Um, my councilwoman, who is a liaison uh, between the town council and the environmental commission, has a very active Facebook page. So we not only post to our Facebook page, but we also ask her to share out if there's anything we want the public to know about. And a couple of others. Your mayor might have an active Facebook page. Um, if you, there are any local magazines, you know, in uh, the Highlands, there's the Skylands magazine. Uh, Tap Into is a great resource. Know who your local reporter is and any regional papers, like I said. Finally, keep track of those communications pieces. So every time you get a media hit about anything, keep track of those and put them in your annual report at the end of the year. That way, once again, you can show how effective you are. And there we go. That was my note about the annual report. So your annual report should include both your accomplishments and your goals for the next year. And like I said, having those communications pieces um, is essential. All right, collaboration and support. Working with elected officials. So this is probably one of the biggest opportunities environmental commissions feel that uh, they have and they don't take advantage of enough. How to work with elected officials. Number one, money. Try to bring in funding. That is probably the best way to get your elected officials on your side. Grants are a great way for the Environmental Commission uh, to bring in funding. Anjac's grants program, like um, we have talked about on many webinars, uh, the application process is still open. Uh, even those small grants, you know, those Anjac's grants are about $1,500, uh, make, make a big difference. And um, having those uh, projects that are actually in the ground uh, that you brought in funding for are really essential and look really good for the Environmental Commission. Uh, build relationship with your elected officials and look for opportunities. So the very first thing I did when I became chair was I invited our mayor to an environmental commission meeting and said, what do you want the environmental commission to work on? His number one thing was I want them to bring well testing back in Clinton Township. So we contacted our local watershed group, Raritan Headwaters, and we have a well testing event in May. That is a great way to build a relationship with your elected official. Again, Know your town administrator because they will keep you in the loop about the budget cycle. Your uh, liaison to the town council should also help you with, out with that. Um, your, the budget is where the environmental commission can go in, ask for money for certain things like, you know, we, we asked for a little bit more money because we wanna buy tablecloths and uh, outreach materials with the plastic bag ban going into effect. Uh, we wanted to be able to print some outreach materials for community day. Um, know your town administrator so that they can tell you when the budget, um, when the budget cycle goes in and when you should have your proposals in. Influencing decision making. So the Environmental Commission, once again, not every Environmental Commission, but the Environmental Commission can and should be influencing the decision making in your town. One great way to do that right now is the climate hazard vulnerability assessment. So ANJAC has done a webinar on this before. We are going to continue doing webinars on this. This is a new requirement in the land use portion of the master plan where the municipality needs to do an assessment to figure out 
what in our town isn't going to do well during the climate crisis. So DEP has some guidance out right now on how to do this. And Jack is working uh, with the DEP to um, do education and strengthen that guidance. Um, making sure that that assessment is in your master plan is a great way to work with elected officials and influence the decision-making of how your land is used in the town. Some other ordinances, so stormwater slash green stormwater infrastructure ordinance. This is a big one. You've probably heard us talk about this thousands of times. DEP right now um, has a model ordinance that every municipality needed to pass by March 2nd, 2021. Oh my God, it's been a year already. Whew. Um, but municipalities can and should go above and beyond what the DEP requires. Some other ordinances that you can uh, work to improve, riparian buffer, wellhead protection, flood zones. If you are in the highlands, highlands conformance. If you're in the pylons, pylons conformance. Lots of opportunities to work with municipal officials. And ANJAC has models for all of these. So if there's anything you want to work on, let us know. Finally, recruiting new members. So one way that one part of the assessment that I showed you is, does your environmental commission reflect your community? Does your membership reflect your community? If your community is majority minority and you have eight white people sitting on your environmental commission, it doesn't reflect your community. If your community is 50% people under the age of 21 and everyone on the, no, you do not have any youth members on the environmental commission. That is not reflecting your community. So when you're recruiting people, make sure that you are incorporating all types of people in your community. And Jack also created the reason it says OBC map there. OBC stands for overburdening communities. So there are about 300, 350-ish municipalities in New Jersey that have something called an overburdened community, which is either uh, a certain percentage of people are uh, below the poverty line, a certain percentage of people are non-white, and a certain percentage of people do not speak English as their first language. If you are interested in knowing if there are any of those communities in your town, reach out to ANJAC or check out um, DEP's uh, page on overburdened communities. Once again, we just want to make sure that environmental commissions are reflecting the membership of the entire town. All right, this is my last section, leadership. One great thing that environmental commissions can do is have a vice chair. So that is not something that is required. It is required that they have a chair, but not a vice chair. I would die without my vice chair. He is so fantastic. And uh, much like a vice president, his only official role is serving as chair if I am not there. But he's also someone that I lean on when I need guidance or help on something like that. Prepare to become chair. If you are on an, on an environmental commission right now, it is extremely likely that you may eventually be asked to be chair. Myself, Janine and Vicki are all nodding because this is probably what happened to us. Um, especially if you go through a lot of ANJAC trainings and you are very knowledgeable, you may eventually be chair. But most importantly, do not fear the chair. Here's a beautiful picture of Sandra O oh as, as chair in the TV show, The Chair. The chair is not meant to be the person who has the most knowledge. It is the person who motivates. It is the person who organizes. It is the person who sets the vision. The chair can outsource work, but you cannot outsource leadership. So the chair, once again, you don't have to be the smartest person. You just have to be the person who is willing to do it and is able to motivate and organize people. Finally, use subcommittees. So this can help shorten time at meetings. I know one of our struggles is keeping our meetings under two hours um, and nobody wants to be sitting in a, uh, a you know, basement somewhere until 10 p.m. at night. Using subcommittees can really help shorten your time at meetings. So have a site plan review subcommittee. If you have a site plan that you know you have to review, you can have one less than a quorum meet and you don't need to comply with the Open Public Meetings Act. So if you have seven people on your environmental commission, one less than a quorum is three people. You can have a subcommittee of three people meet and go over site plans. Same with event planning, 
Um, you can have one less than the quorum. You can also have volunteers outside of the Environmental Commission help, and that's why I put it in green team as well. So a green team is um, kind of like a, an arm of the Environmental Commission, but they are not subject to the same laws because they are not appointed. There is no establishing ordinance. They're usually established by resolution. Once again, we go over all this in the fundamentals, but the green team can be really useful um, in being the arm of the uh, Environmental Commission that is not subject to the same restrictions. Finally, citizens groups. So I'm gonna take off my uh, Clinton Township chair hat and talk a little bit about citizens groups. Um, if the Environmental Commission is trying to get something done and they are uh, meeting resistance, you can form a citizens group. Um, CCCT stands for Concerned Citizens of Chester Township. Um, when the Environmental Commission was trying to push back on a development project in Chester Township, they were not successful. So they created a citizens group. That is an outside group, again, not subject to uh, the Environmental Commission rules of meeting and keeping minutes and everything like that. That is an advocacy group. Another story is in Mansfield. In Mansfield um, they uh, actually tried to dissolve the Environmental Commission. Um, the mayor uh, tried to get rid of it. Uh, what ended up happening was the Environmental Commission chair ran to against the mayor in that election and won. So keep in mind, you know, being involved goes beyond just being on the Environmental Commission. Some final thoughts before I pass it off. You may never feel ready. Probably one of the biggest things that I hear at ANJAC is, how do I know when I'm ready? How do I know when I'm ready to do a site plan? How do I know when I'm ready to become an environmental commissioner? You may never feel ready. I do not feel ready to be a chair, but if you don't do it, who will? This is a picture I probably have in every single one of my presentations from CJ Craig, uh, the West Wing. Decisions are made by those who show up, not by those who have the most knowledge, not by those who tr you know try and have the most degrees. It is by people who show up. It is so important for environmental commissioners to exist and do everything they can, but you do not have to be the smartest person in the room. You just have to show up. So that is the end of my section. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to introduce next, we have uh, my good friend, Janine. So Janine's nickname is Green Janine. She's chair of Manalapan Township uh, Environmental Commission, and uh, she actually wrote a children's book also that I hope she will talk about. Um, Janine, as I said, is a former uh, EPA um, employee, and she also worked at the New York City DEP. Um, also very cool, uh, she was recently a docent at the Bronx Zoo. So Janine, I am going to mute myself and let you take it away. Hey, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And you can see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I did it. All right. Shared screen and I'm muted. Um, so thank you so much, Alex. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so again, I'm with the Manalapan Environmental Commission. And I just wanted to begin by saying our three big overarching goals um, are of course, environmental protection, also providing education for residents and um, building awareness of our environmental commission, which I think help us to achieve the first two goals. And of course, we review applications for development on a regular basis, which is the one activity that the town requires of us. But we try to do much more. And I'm going to briefly describe four other activities that help us to meet our goals, um, starting with the simplest thing we do, and then I'll share three other activities kind of in increasing order of how involved um, or time consuming they are to execute. So the first thing I wanna talk about is something Alex already addressed, which is the annual report. Um, so I don't wanna say too much about that here because she did cover it, but um, in addition to it summarizing everything that we've done over the past year, I did wanna add that we include thank yous in our report to town departments, elected officials, and anyone else who helped to support our efforts over the previous year. And I did learn at an event like this, which Alex talked about tonight, the importance of 
reading our report into the record at a township committee meeting. So um, one side of your screen is a screenshot of my doing that recently with our 2021 report. The meetings are televised. Um, they are played on our local channel and on the, um, they're available on the internet. And so I took a screenshot for this. And next to it, you will see a screenshot of uh, a newspaper article because typically every year our local paper will also publish an article about our report. So you can also send your report into local paper and ask them um, to write an article. In our case, we're lucky because they attend these meetings and actually ask us for a copy of the report. But the report really does help build awareness and appreciation of the Environmental Commission and all that it does. And sometimes it also brings in more volunteers. So it is very important as simple as it is. And the next thing I wanna tell you about is our tip of the month. And what you see up here are four of our tips. And uh, you'll notice that they have a similar look about them. We are trying to, we try to kind of brand them so that they become recognizable, hopefully eventually in the community. And they are actually made by high school and college students who we ask for help with this. We've been doing this for a few years. And we distribute them as widely as we can. We um, are always looking for new ideas of how we can distribute it. And right now, the, the places that we do share it with the community are um, obviously through social media, always a great way. And also at the bottom of email blasts from our town. There is something called the paperless backpack, which reaches a lot of people. And for anyone who is not familiar with that, um, you know, kids used to bring home tons of flyers and their folders from school for their parents. And nowadays, um, to go green and save money, uh, the community has what they call a paperless backpack, which is basically a superintendent's office sends out an email to the parents once or twice a month with a digital version of all those flyers that used to come home. So we send this to the superintendent's office and they send this out with the paperless backpack. Um, also, the high school students read them once a month on the um, morning announcements at their school and our local cable channel also puts a slide up for the month on their channel. And uh, just to, the ones that I have up here, one of them is about uh, bar greening your barbecue in the summer. Uh, one is about where you can recycle styrofoam in, the, in uh, Monmouth County. Uh, one is about uh, what you can do with your old bike because far too often I see them at the curb on garbage day. And the last one um, up here on the screen is about the importance of um, native plants and directs people to jerseyyards.org, which I think is an incredibly important website to try to uh, direct residents who have a yard to use. So wherever I can, I'm always looking for places to tell people about that. Now, next, I wanna tell you about our native plant sale. And that is something that we do about once a year. Of course, with COVID, we missed a couple of years. So we had our first plant sale in a while in September. And these pictures are from that event. We had an incredible turnout. I don't know if it's because we learned more about advertising or because we hadn't had one in a long time, but we, were, we did so well that we've decided in 2022 that we're gonna have um, two sales with the first one being on June 4th. So if anybody wants to come, they're more than welcome. And I, this is not something we make any money from. We make zero dollars. This is just a way for us to get more um, native plants and more habitat built within our community as open space is disappearing. And in one of these pictures, you see um, a bunch of tables set up. So at the plant sale, we always have about half a dozen tables, some of them set up by environmental commissioners, but also we invite groups down. So like, for example, we um, usually have a table from the master gardeners, sometimes some local naturalists and other organizations. And in this picture, the woman who is wearing the pink shirt is our township forester, who is there um, this year to talk about spotted lanternfly and how to mulch a tree properly which is uh, often not done right in our community. And I don't know if you can tell, but she is holding a microphone and she is speaking to a gentleman in a blue shirt who has a video camera. And he is a volunteer from our local cable channel, MTTN. And we asked them to come to our plant sale 
and to um, make a little show for the cable channel, which um, they did. And so they talked to everybody who had a table about why they were there and they taught something. And they talked to our vendor who is very knowledgeable about native plants and he talked about their benefits. Um, and then they aired that on the local channel and put it as a Vimeo up on the web, on the uh, internet. And as a result of that, we're able to reach more people than those who show up um, on sale day. And lastly, I want to tell you about our eco patio, which is basically an outdoor environmental education area that we created at our rec center. And um, it's in an area that's very high foot sure. traffic. Um, and it is a place where we create created more habitat for pollinators, but also a place where we're able to increase awareness of the need for habitat, how people can help at their homes, uh, a, a way to increase nature appreciation, and um, teach people about ways that they can go green. And this is what it looks like when you arrive. Again, this is a very high traffic area in the summer. And I'm gonna go through a bunch of slides now. And Alex, you tell me if I'm running out of time because I was gonna set a timer and I forgot. Um, but I wanna show you all the elements of the eco patio. So this is a rain garden, a demonstration rain garden. And this is the very first thing that we put in here. Uh, this is what it looks like in early spring. It does get much taller. And when we planted this, we had no plans to do anything else here at that time, but we have kind of every year since then add an additional element to the area. You'll see on the, the side over here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, there's a path. And on the other side of that path is a garden that is just starting to come up in this photo. And that is a butterfly garden, a specialized butterfly garden called a Monarch Way Station. And um, for those who don't know, that is a butterfly garden that has milkweed in it, which is a plant that Monarch butterflies require to survive. This is another picture of that garden with a close up of the milkweed plants. And here is a picture showing you um, that we've had great success uh, in helping the monarchs with this garden. Um, and the one picture, if, if uh, I don't know how well you guys can see it there, but if you were to count, there's at least 15 caterpillars on this milkweed. And this is a picture of an actual uh, monarch chrysalis in the garden, this garden, and this is a female monarch butterfly who is actually in the process of depositing an egg on the bottom of a leaf. You can see she's bending her abdomen. You can even see the murals that you might have noticed in the previous picture in the background. This is a bench made out of recycled plastic. We've put in a couple of these to try to help people learn about the importance of buying recycled. This is a patio made out of permeable pavers that we were able to put in through a partnership with a local business who installs these patios. And um, I should say permeable, pav permeable pavers are um, important uh, or their significance is that they help to prevent stormwater runoff. And these are some students from the high school environmental club and they are the ones who have painted all the murals that we have here. Fortunately, they have a very artistic advisor um, and they've done such beautiful work. This is a picture of what the girls were making in that particular photo you just saw. And I love this idea the students had. They painted these butterflies which make this an actually an interactive mural. Um, I don't know how much success we've had, but we've been trying to get the word out within the community that you can do this, that this is, um, you know, that these are um, put here specifically to take a picture in this way and try to draw people into the area. This is a before and after picture of one of the murals and you can see how this ugly dumpster was beautified. And this, um, is simply a storage garage from our, uh, for our DPW or Department of Public Works. And it was just a tan wall before they painted this. So it's the backdrop for our Monarch Way Station with little monarchs. And the newest element we have added, um, again, the high school students are helping us to paint sidewalk games around the area to draw people over. And uh, last spring they painted this hopscotch board and in just a couple of weeks they're going to be painting tic-tac-toe and box ball. 
This is a little free library that a Boy Scout put in for us. And this is a place where people can take a book or leave a book. We are very fortunate in Manalapan that our Department of Public Works has a sign shop and we were able to put in several educational signs. And this is one that is all about the significance of the Monarch Butterfly and the Monarch Way Station. This one with the adorable little froggy with the umbrella teaches about rain gardens. And this is a kiosk that we put in with a grant from Anjex Open Space Stewardship. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> And I just want to point out there's a thank you sign below it. Always important to thank those who help and, and donate. Um, I will be wrapping it up, Alex. Don't worry. I just wanted to say here that a tip for everybody. These are pictures of volunteers and with volunteers. And some of these pictures are students from JROTC. If you have a high school near you with a JROTC program, those students not only need volunteer hours, they specifically need conservation hours. So they are a wonderful group to ask for help on your projects. And I'll just end by saying that um, planting just one plant increases habitat. So, you know, even that makes a difference. So all projects matter, even small projects. And, um, and thank you. Awesome, thank you. We're getting some questions. Is it okay if we send this presentation out to everyone? Uh, sure, I can send it to you. Great, thank you. There's lots of good ideas in there, Janine. I'm very excited um, to hear everyone's thoughts on that. So um, next, I'm gonna pass it off to Vicki. So Vicki is actually also a former EPA employee. Um, she uh, retired from EPA in 2014, but while she was there, she earned multiple awards. Um, she is currently the chair of uh, Washington Township Environmental Commission in Gloucester County. Um, she is also basically, it looks like a volunteer for everything. Um, a chair of the Environmental Commission, uh, Sustainable Washington Township Green Team, member of the Open Space Advisory Team, and leading the uh, Green Team Advisory Committee. She's also the recipient of the Rick Zammer Award from the Greater Washington Township Chamber of Commerce. So, Vicki, feel free to unmute yourself, and we are excited to hear from you. Thank you, Alex, and let me congratulate you, Janine, on that great presentation. There'll be a little redundancy, but um, I've learned a great deal. Thank you. Um, Washington Township, where I hail from, is in Gloucester County. We're a community of about 50,000 people, and uh, we are South Jersey, but not far south. So we're sort of uh, suburban Philadelphia in many respects. We are farmland that has been converted into suburbia in many ways. We are very blessed in that we have the largest municipal park in the state. Um, our uh, forefathers, foremothers, et cetera, about 30 years ago determined that they would purchase several farms and created an absolutely beautiful farm, uh, excuse me, park, Washington Lake Park. And that is really the uh, centerpiece and gemstone for our community. Many of our activities take place in Washington Lake Park. Uh, our Environmental Commission was formed in 88. I think that was probably when environmental commissions were first authorized by the municipal land use law. And we were very fortunate in that we had very smart and strong folks who were there at the initiation of the commission. Uh, over the years, we grew in numbers and capacity, uh, but many of us have been with the commission. I was not there in 88, but many of us have been with the commission for a very long period of time, 15 years or more. So we have a very cohesive group and, and we're fortunate that uh, folks work together very well. We also have overlap with other organizations and many associate members. So we have folks who are on the Open Space Advisory Committee, on our green team, um, and then many other groups. We have sort of an extended family of people who are involved with environmental matters. So we have uh, taken advantage of that and we've developed many additional relationships with organizations and, and people over the years. Um, I guess we've done some of the very routine activities that environmental commissions are obligated to do. We've done some better than others, <laughs> but uh, 
we actually updated our ERI after 25 years of not having been updated in 2017. But we have amended our ordinance so that we are required to look at it at least every year and determine if there are particular pieces of it that ought to be updated or warrant attention. We do site plan reviews. We handle those pretty much in our workshop meetings. We meet monthly and have um, an, in a business meeting. And then uh, on the third Thursday of each month, we have a workshop meeting to address site plans or special event planning or something like that. And uh, we try to address what I think everybody shares, our, our basic objectives and in a routine manner and then by introducing special projects. So we want, of course, to uh, address environmental protection, especially water protection, especially groundwater protection in our community. Groundwater is our source of drinking water. Uh, we uh, actually are really somewhat dedicated to environmental education and then finally to community involvement. So I'll go on with some of our projects here. This is our annual cleanup day. We've been doing this. I don't think that, um, I, I don't think Annie Hastings is on this call, but if she were, she's one of our commission members, she's the vice chair and she's the one who coordinates this whole thing. And we've been doing a cleanup of one sort or of another for about 16 years, I think. She could correct me if she were on the call. Uh, it started out much smaller, but every year we have actually several hundred volunteers. And this has been a very good uh, sort of um, ethic building effort in our community. This will illustrate that we have many volunteers. I think, uh, Alex, you were the one who mentioned the community hours, community service hours that students are looking for. So we have uh, school organizations, clubs, we have church groups, we have many different kinds of folks and individuals who come out for our cleanup day. Uh, we provide gloves and trash bags and recycling bags and then invite everybody back to our park for a barbecue. On the upper right, you will see that one of our council members and the mayor, uh, council members and the mayor cook the, the burgers and the hot dogs. And there's Ann Culkin, our co-chair for the cleanup day, who is uh, getting ready to pack up the, the burgers. And you can see all of the, not everybody comes back to the park, but we usually have at least uh, 100 or so people back at the park for our barbecue and then uh, at the lower left, you'll see that we, because there are a lot of people there, a lot of our elected officials like to attend as well. So we have our uh, assembly representative, Paul Moriarty and Senator Fred Madden with us. And they are presenting our annual environmental commissioners award to Jim McCann. You'll hear Jim's name repeated. He is one of our public works, former public works uh, employees who is now retired, but who has been just a great help to us in so many things that we do. And he's getting the commissioner's award. Three years ago, our last real cleanup day, you know what happened in between. So um, we of course have Earth Day celebrations over the years. Uh, this has evolved. Um, what we've learned to do is uh, make new friends, but keep the old ones and then uh, sort of and engage new ideas, but polish the ones that have worked well for us. Uh, over the years, that, that's me in that Woodsy Owl costume, and I swear I will never do that again. If any of you have ever had the opportunity to do that, you need to jump into a shower as quickly as you can afterwards. But that's one of our um, community uh, children's reading um, activities. Uh, here we have the what used to be the master gardeners that are now the, um, uh, they're not called the master gardeners, they're called the certified gardeners in Gloucester County. They, they have separated from Rutgers program, uh, giving a presentation on, on our um, backyard habitats. And I wanted to point out that both of those activities are in our public library. The library has been a fabulous partner. For any of you who have not been able to take advantage of that, Libraries are community centers, and they are eager to have uh, this sort of thing to share with their public, with our public, all of us together. In fact, last evening, we just had a, a presentation by New Jersey Audubon that we invited in to do a presentation on um, 
bird breeding and uh, bird behavior, nesting behavior, hosted by the library, uh, but funded by the Environmental Commission. And uh, the library has just been a, a stalwart friend. We actually have done grant applications together and uh, the library is doing some activities for Earth Day this year or for Earth Month. They are sponsoring them and pulling them together on their own. <laughs> Uh, the next activity is at a farm market that's a prize wheel um, that we've tried to use to engage kids. Kids that small generally can't answer the questions. <laughs> they like to spin the wheel anyway. Um, that was in 2019, the last actual outdoor Earth Day celebration that we had. If you go to the lower left, you'll see this little uh, um, collage of um, artwork for a gallery in the park. I've said that we have an extended environmental family. Our green team has created a creative team. Uh, in 2020, you know, we couldn't do very much in the way of public events, but that was the first year that we had a creative team and we dedicated our first exhibit to mark the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day. And that gave us the theme for our first exhibit in our outdoor gallery in our park. So we uh, were able to, to marry that, uh, marry our green team activities and environmental activities that year. This is 2019 when, uh, excuse me, 2021, when we gave away tree seedlings, the New Jersey forestry program to um, revegetate the state after we lost so many trees during Sandy and then so many other storms. We had to adapt again. Here we had folks drive up and pick up their trees, but we had a steady stream of cars and we gave away 400 trees that year and we expect to do 500 this year. This is a new project that we started in, well, it was new in 2017 and that was our Bluebird Buddies project. This is part of our educational efforts and, and getting the community involved. We have 16 bluebird boxes now on open spaces, public lands in the township and have recruited uh, individuals from the community to be bluebird monitors. They um, clean the boxes, monitor them for egg laying and for the uh, uh, first signs of hatching. And then we watch the baby's age oh so tenderly, there they are being banded. Uh, that is uh, Dan Gilchrist from uh, in the upper left from the New Jersey Bluebird Society who helped us get this started. The Gloucester County Nature Club also worked with us to get this initiated. And he bans these little bluebirds. We, uh, the program has grown over the years. And uh, last year we had more than 60 fledglings uh, from our various boxes and we're just oh so proud. This is our community garden. This is one of the projects that um, was really led by our open space advisory committee, but uh, we partnered uh, both the environmental commission and open space. This is on land that is in our park, uh, but our public works department helped us establish it. Our we actually had gifts from two of our council members that allowed us to put up the fencing. And uh, the Boy Scouts now put up the mulching to separate the plots. We have 30 10 by 10 plots that are um, available for leasing by the public at $15 for the season. And uh, again, Jim McCann, who <laughs> the fellow that I mentioned earlier uh, is our sort of resident uh, agrarian specialist, and uh, he helps us a great deal in advising the gardeners and making sure that the plot is properly tilled and so forth. One uh, lesson I've learned is to make things events. That helps with the education, but it also helps to draw attention not only to the commission, but to what we think we can offer to the public. That is our mayor on the left turning the soil with the annual opening of the community garden. We make it a big deal. So that uh, again, you know, we can uh, advertise not only, usually by the time we open the garden, all of the plots are leased, but uh, if there are any left, we can make sure that um, 
anybody can take advantage of those. And uh, it brings a lot of good attention to our efforts and to good things like gardening. Here we have uh, Girl Scout daisies planting some flowers outside of the garden. That's always a big attraction. And yes, monarch butterflies, are, they really capture everybody's imagination. We started our monarch rescue project about five years ago. And uh, we have a small greenhouse in the park, uh, not in the greatest shape, but it's uh, good enough for us to be able to uh, actually grow lots of good things. Uh, Jim McCann helped us again, but uh, we last year had um, something like, let's see, 800 plants to give away. What we have done is package them uh, for plants and um, those little cubes and put them in these uh, brown paper bags with instructions for uh, planting and distributed them to the public. We used to distribute them uh, at our Super Saturday event in early May. And then of course we couldn't do it with COVID. So we did the same sort of thing, advertised it and had folks drive up and we had a steady stream and it has become one of the things that our residents look forward to every spring. So now we have folks planting milkweed in their uh, backyards. And we also have expanded that with marigolds last year too. So we advertise that as sort of a natural pesticide to help people with their gardens. So I think I'll stop there, but um, I guess one of the things that I, I just um, wanted to advise that there are things that we were not able to do that we've had to uh, adapt. We would do annual stream sampling with school students. We had a number of other activities that we just had to abandon for the last couple of years. Uh, but we've been able to pick up some other activities. And uh, there's some other things that we're thinking about trying to do uh, next year or this year to start. Uh, and that is to see if we can plant some Atlantic white cedar uh, to uh, help that population that has been waning in the state. And uh, we'll see how well that goes. And we'll be happy to report to others to see if we think that that will uh, carry us. Um, and uh, we also are trying some new partnerships. So we're pollinator garden is a, a wonderful idea. And we have our Rotary Club partnering with us on that. Uh, they have an operation pollination that is a national program. And that's something that some of you might want to consider engaging your Rotary Club with. And uh, I guess that's it for now. And I'll be happy to answer questions. Sure, thank you, Vicki. Um, the first question that a lot of people are asking is what transcription program do you use? <laughs> I thought it was you. I didn't know it was me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll figure that out later. Yes, someone okay. in the chat just asked that. Um, yeah, so I, I am so inspired by both of you. I already have thousands of ideas for my own EC. Um, and I just want to let you know that the chat has been saying the same thing. Lots of people are saying, wow, what a great idea. Um, Vicki, is it also okay if we send out your uh, presentation uh, to the group? Of course. Okay, great. Um, so we have just a couple questions and then we will, um, we will make sure everyone can get back to their night. Um, the first question is not just for Vicki and Janine, but for everyone here. Um, Vicki, you can feel free to stop sharing whenever you're ready. Um, and I know someone on this call has already done this, but one person asked, um, has anyone successfully uh, had their the enhanced stormwater ordinance that ANJAC and the Watershed Institute worked on, um, has anyone been able to pass that in their town? So we'll start with that question. Feel free to unmute or uh, raise your virtual hand if you um, would like to chime in. Yeah, this is Isla Vassallo in Esham Township. We were successful in, it's Esham Township, but it's better known as Marlton probably. Um, we were successful in passing an enhanced stormwater control ordinance. And we worked with the Watershed Institute and um, the township engineer and our community development. 
And Isla, what are some things that you think made it successful? Do you think, was the town council ready to listen? Did you have to work on them a little bit? Tell us a little bit about the story of how it passed. Right, I think in this particular case, we ha definitely had town council support um, before we even kind of dove into it. There was um, acknowledgement that this was coming down the pike. And then um, we have uh, a skilled person on, on our environmental commission who is um, somewhat familiar with stormwater control, uh, stormwater management type um, you know, uh, implementations. So uh, what happened was the uh, township engineer came up with their version, a draft version of um, the, and, uh, the, their, the new stormwater control ordinance mm -hmm. that was based on the state. Mm -hmm. And um, we took, we were given that in advance and myself and another woman um, then took that and, and modified um, where we thought we, we could um, using the TWI's uh, information. Mm -hmm. And we put most of that in. Um, the only thing we didn't put in was minor um, development uh, requirements we thought that might be pushing it a little bit too much. Um, but uh, I will say that we were lucky in the fact that we did have uh, support from township officials go going into this. Thank you, Isla. That's a, a very good, very good example. And I think I like that you modified it for your town. And I think that is something that anyone can do. You don't have to pass every part of the ordinance right away you can make incremental progress. You can pass an ordinance at any time. You know, you do not have to pass a, an entirely new ordinance today. Anyone else able to get an enhanced ordinance and would like to share? All right, well, if, if you um, are interested in learning a little bit more about the enhanced ordinance, um, Anja can certainly connect you with someone who um, has. There are many environmental commissions and municipalities in the state that have uh, passed an enhanced ordinance. And we consider an enhanced ordinance anything that is above the model ordinance. Like I said, it doesn't need to have every uh, provision that the Watershed Institute and ANJAC outlined. Um, so like I said, reach out to us if you're interested. We're happy to uh, connect you with someone. So um, we also got a question in the chat about overburdened communities. So um, this, we're not gonna spend too much time talking on tonight, recognizing that it's a little, it's almost 8.30. Um, and uh, we, the reason I'm not going to address it too much tonight is because we actually have an entirely other round table that is gonna be about overburdened communities and environmental justice. So for those of you who may not know, when I say overburdened communities, those are the communities that are outlined in the new cumulative um, impacts law that New Jersey passed. Um, I talked about the three criteria uh, previously but they are using those criteria to figure out where there is environmental injustice. So if you are interested in learning more about those overburdened communities, if you are interested in learning about what role environmental commissions will have in addressing those environmental injustices, um, our, Liz, remind me, it's June, is that correct? The June round table? Yes, it's on, it's on June 14th, which is a Tuesday. So, Perfect. So you'll be, we'll be sending out emails. Um, we wanted to get this round table over first before we started advertising that one. Um, so we'll be sending out uh, registration information for that. So if you are interested in learning more about that, please, please sign up for that one. Um, finally, uh, someone else also, a whole bunch of people emphasize libraries, which, um, uh, you know, Vicki talked about how uh, great and important those are. Just wanted to emphasize that. That is one idea that I'm going to take home to my environmental commission. There is also a lot of uh, talk about where to get saplings. <laughs> so um, a few people in the chat already uh, talked about this, but the US Forest Service every year does give out saplings. It is more competitive than Harvard admissions. They turned away, I just saw a whole bunch of people start nodding. You need to get that application in fast. And US Forest Service starts doing outreach to the municipality. Um, so you need to, once again, have a good relationship with your township administrator so that when they get that email from the US Forest Service in 
you know, I think it was like January, February this year, um, in preparation for Arbor Day and Earth Day, um, they will send it to you right away and you can put in that order as soon as possible. So just so you know, every municipality did get an email about it. It does not go to the Environmental Commission, it goes to the municipality. So make sure you know your township administrator so that they can forward you that email. Does anyone else wanna talk a little bit about where they can get plants and saplings and everything like that? I, I just have uh, it's, uh, Robert Koch, I'm the chairman of Stafford Township. How are you? Good, it's nice to meet you, Robert. You too. Um, as I spoke to the state forestry about the uh, trees. They only have shrubs left. They, I was told that they uh, they couldn't do plantings the last couple of years because of the uh, the pandemic. Mm. Don't know if there's any truth to that, but uh, we were only able to, able to get shrubs. No, that's year. a good point. Mm -hmm. And you're right; that's probably going to affect the future. Also, I bet it was it probably wasn't the pandemic. It's probably shortage of staffing that they probably just didn't have the staff to actually do the plan. Yeah, I, I think you're. I think yeah. you probably hit the nail on the head. Yeah, which means that probably in the next few years it's going to be even more competitive as those saplings, you know, yes, age yes. out and everything. So they, that's they a good did, point. They Robert. did mention that also. Yeah. Um, Sometimes the soil conservation districts, like the, each county has a soil conservation district, they sometimes have saplings for maybe not free, but super low cost, like a hundred for $10 or something. So you might want to check around at, in your soil conservation mm -hmm. district, mm -hmm. as well as some of the watershed um, groups like the Watershed Institute or- You stole my next part, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them may also have, so check out your local um, you know, uh, groups. And if you're not sure, if you want some assistance, just email us at uh, info at amject.org. I'll put that in the chat, but we can certainly help you try to navigate around a little bit. Sophie? Yeah, uh, I just want to point out, someone asked about getting milkweed plants mm -hmm. and it's not very difficult. Our first milkweed plants we got from the state of New Jersey, they had sent a message out, we answered right away and we got some and they are very easy to reproduce. So even if you only get a handful to start with, oh. And they, another two years, they'll go into seeds and those seeds, which are, you know, the flow in the milk, uh -huh. seeds, black seeds on the end, uh, you plant them and you have more than you know what to do with. So it's much easier than it sounds. Well, Sophie, I, that is such a good point. Yes. And and Megan, I saw you ask the question about how Vicky can afford to give away free milkweeds, but I just want to just, emphasize. I just yeah. paid $1,200 for 500 milkweed plugs from I from um, Toad Shade Flower Farm. Mm -hmm. $1,200 for 500 So um, it's amazing that you guys can give away 800 That's like a fortune. <laughs> yes, I, I can just say that they're grown from seed in our greenhouse. Oh. So, oh, you know, so great. the seeds aren't that expensive. <laughs> no, 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 we just yeah. haven't had any luck growing them ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you guys, this is amazing that you could do that. That is such a, I love the idea of self-propagation because that is just mm -hmm. a, a perfect, like, in, of all the values of an environmental commission, right? Absolutely. All right, great. Thank you, Vicki. So I see uh, we have Steve and then Rachel, and then I think we're gonna wrap up. So Steve, go ahead. Hi, everybody. My name is Steve Isaacson. I'm also from the Closter Environmental Commission. Behind me is the Bazzoni Farm, which we're working on a pollinator garden there. And I discovered a site which I put into the chat called the Planet B Foundation. And they have seed ball programs where they will send you enough supplies to create 900 seed balls of pollinator plants. And the kids can make them and throw them in their backyards, wherever. You don't even have to plant them. All you have to do is throw them. And uh, I think it's a great idea and it's free. And I think we just uh, picked up ours at the borough hall. So we're going to start working with the nature center, the schools, and it's a great way to bring the community together. Thank you. That is so cool, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. This is definitely going to go into Anjak's um, resource center so that we can we can share this with everyone else. Thank you. All right, we have Rachel next. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rachel Funchen. I'm chair of the Watchung Borough Environmental Commission in Somerset County. Um, 
amazed by the projects that the two women who spoke have. We're, we're a very small borough, only 6,000 residents, and uh, we do not have the kind of massive um, help from the community that I guess you have in those larger towns. But I just wanted to say about the milkweed, because we're whenever I hear the word milkweed, I get very excited. I planted a big pollinator garden in my own uh, front yard um, two years ago, even though the person, who, the landscaper who put it in said, oh, they get very messy. Nobody does that in their front yards. People do it in their backyards. And I said, well, you don't understand. I'm trying to set an example for the community. So it's gorgeous. And this is the third year. Um, but I wanted to say that we, we gave away milkweed seeds in little I hate to say little plastic bags at one of our green, the last live green fair we had, uh, I think it was in 2019, they all went very quickly. And um, my own garden last year produced, I, I picked maybe 30 or 40 pods off my uh, milkweed plants. And I read that each pod has 400, about 400 seeds in it. So we were lucky this year to get 250 seedlings from the Forest Service because we were really on top of that all the seedlings went within 72 hours they told almost all of them went so um we're going to we're giving out the seedlings at our town cleanup which is later this month um and we're also going to be we're going to be pulling apart my seed my milkweed seed pods putting them in bags and giving them out to people and they they reproduce so quickly you just literally stick your finger in the ground and drop a seed in and you're going to have a milkweed plant and the next year you're going to have twice as many and the year after that they're going to be spreading over your whole yard so <laughs> yeah, i just want to say yeah they're very easy to grow and if you can find milkweed pods on any you know it's too late now but in the fall um just collect mm -hmm. the pods they grow alongside the roads or people who have pollinator gardens and you can just give them out to residents give each resident 20 seeds or 30 seeds something like that that's mm -hmm. what we're planning to do when we give out the seedlings from the forest service Janine, Alex, can i just give her an yeah. idea yeah i just wanted to tell you when you give away the seeds um what we use instead of plastic bags um you can buy what looks like a manila envelope you know like your tan manila envelope like miniature like i'm not even sure what they're really supposed to be for they're mm -hmm. like uh three inches tall um and i you know oh, i got my i got my box. new library card in one of those they're almost like card sized right I, mm -hmm. you buy them at staples or something yeah. or online but they're little mm -hmm. tiny envelopes and you just put some seeds in there you can lick it shut and then you can you can put a little sticker that you print out on the outside of it that explains the directions of how to plant it and that's what um that's what we do i actually went to whole foods and bought biodegradable little plastic baggies so you know we we're not going to give out the, the bad kind but that's this a great will actually suggestion. save you money and it's um it's it, you know it, it and it's a little better because i don't want to get all into that but um i think biodegradable plastic is not really biodegradable so okay <laughs> that's <laughs> so a whole other giving, issue and and we are giving out uh planting instructions with each uh you know to each person that we give the milk oh. mm -hmm. well, for the and future the manila envelope um it thing works really well and is inexpensive vicky Thank did you, you want to add something i i did i i wanted to say that you know the the monarch butterflies are so iconic and they really capture everyone's attention and it's wonderful that you know people are able to grow milkweed but um i what we have found is that it's really an opportunity because they are such a wonderful environmental lesson you know to teach about the the monarch's migration and and you know all of those crazy generations and and how important it is that they find habitat where they can't reproduce so we have a little story and a little picture of migration routes that we stick in those bags as well um, and so the bags come in handy for that reason but um, if, if any of you are gonna do the monarch thing, don't miss the opportunity to tell the story because that is just so very valuable. No, nothing captures people like butterflies, right? <laughs> it's the way a lot of people came into environmentalism is just looking at what was in there outside, right? Um, all right, so we are about to wrap up. So just a reminder, a few reminders. Um, one, everything is recorded. Everything is going to be distributed to everyone. Um, do not worry about that. It, sometimes it takes a couple days. So please just be a little bit patient as Zoom and the cloud all communicate and tell us when they are ready. Um, 
Again, we have our next round table is gonna be in June. That's gonna be on environmental justice. If you are um, interested, please sign up, keep an eye out to your email. And we have a very exciting opportunity for all of you environmental commissioners to show off your work more. Um, if those of some of you attended Anjac's virtual Earth Day Fair last year, we are going to do it again this year. It is an opportunity for environmental commissions to create some kind of presentation, whether it's a video, PowerPoint, send it to Anjac and we can create a virtual booth for you. We are gonna, it is free to create a booth. It is free to attend. It uses the virtual platform called Hop In. You should have gotten some emails about how to register uh, for a booth. Um, like I said, it's free. Everyone is encouraged to do so. You do not have to attend the event to have a booth. That is the beauty of having a virtual platform. You don't even have to be there and you can show off your work. If you have any questions, please contact info at Anjak. That is going to be on Earth Day, which is a Friday, April 22nd from 11 to 12. We are also going to have a group meditation that is uh, run by the group Earth Spirit, which is going to be very exciting. So please, 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 create a booth, send us an email. If you have questions about it, you should have gotten an email about how to register for that. A huge, huge thank you to Vicki and Janine. We're gonna do some silent claps and snaps for them. You, you as environmental commissioners constantly inspire us both as environmental commissions and as ANJAC employees. We love hearing on what you're working on. We love hearing your ideas. This is why we love doing these round tables. So one final thank you to Liz Ritter, who is the brains and tech guru behind all of these. So another little silent clap for Liz. Thank you Liz all for attending. This is wonderful. Really great to have all this time to share and see you all and hear you guys sharing your ideas and programs. It's so wonderful. So we really you. appreciate it. Great so job, much, Alex. So. I want to yeah. thank Alex, of course, because she did a wonderful job sort of guiding us along. So thank you. Thanks to all the other ANJAC staff that are here. And again, thanks especially to Janine and Vicki for participating tonight. Thank we you will all. see you in June. Enjoy your night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.